All right, guys, today we are going to be doing a longer video. So hopefully you are prepared for a video that's not gonna be super fast, but very comprehensive. And we're gonna be going over my entire essentially personal survival kit. Now I do this about every year or so, and I like to incorporate the updates and the refinements that I make in these kits. Some of it's user suggestions, or sorry, comments, commenter suggestions, and some of it's just learning throughout and actually doing things. So today we're gonna to be breaking it all down and going over kind of the mindset of each piece. And the largest part will be the actual personal survival kit itself. But I believe very strongly that when it comes to a personal survival kit like this, there's no small, reasonably man portable kit that you can have on your body or on your person at all times that is as comprehensive as a full kit. So we're gonna be talking about every component and all of this is going to be able to be reasonably easily carried in a essentially a you know good stout having a good stout belt like a duty belt on and then having cargo pants and all of this will fit in that kind of setup so we're going to go into it like i said the survival kit will be the last and we're just going to break down each each bit of it so first up we're going to go over the firearm to get this guy out of the way now a firearm can vary um, between months and for the most part, I do tend to run a 44 Magnum. Now this is my model 29. This is an older school, but pretty cool gun. Like I said, this is a 44 Magnum and obviously unloaded for you guys interested. Um, but yeah, it's a double action 44 Magnum. And that's usually what I like to run because it's the most versatile bear gun in Alaska, in my opinion. It can easily handle black bears. Um, obviously getting into the larger bears, it gets less capable, but with stout loads, it is still good. In addition to this as i've shown in previous videos i also like to carry a little box of 44s so this carries about 18 so you have six in the gun which obviously is unloaded for the video purposes but you'd have six in the gun and then another 18 ready to go so in case you do need extra ammunition um, in addition to this the extra ammunition can serve a purpose of being pulled down you can use the powder in a pinch to help start fires wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you absolutely need to but that is a second use tertiary use but it is nice to have some additional ammunition in case you exhaust ammo um, once again if you use uh, rounds for firing emergency shots some people do I don't typically recommend that um, but if you do need to you can you know, fire three rounds as a form of distress call and once again 44 is not going to be a quiet gun by any means so depending on what your survival aspects look like you know firing a gun for distress that, you know making the sound for stress calls can be potentially useful so those are some aspects people may ask you know like why do you want additional ammunition do you think you're going to get in a shootout with a bunch of bears not really but there are some additional aspects such as fire starting and using your gun for creation the creation of sound for distress um, that can be useful so there are purposes above and beyond for additional ammunition. And if you can carry it, you can carry it. If not, six rounds isn't the best, but it is adequate for most single threats. All right, so now getting into more of the tools for survival. So first off, we're gonna talk about the knives. And um, I think the knife is probably one of the most important aspects of survival because it is probably the jack of all, master of none. Now I go back and forth and obviously my channel does primarily fixate on knives do a lot of you know commentary about knives so there are a lot of options for me in previous years and still for the most part I do really love my Chris Reef uh, Pacific it is a strong option but I'm actually gonna switch it up for this video and uh, I do honestly or I am starting to run this knife in circulation this is the architect knives it's AK 6.5 you guys can see there this one's in CPM 3v and uh, this one has burlap red burlap micarta handles so very comfy things i do really like about this knife as i've talked about in previous videos when it comes to survival knives if you're new to the channel and you're not super familiar with survival knives usually what i look for for survival specific is six to seven inches of blade length i also really like a forward finger choil for being able to choke up and get very close to that edge that's really useful for when it comes down to doing things like feather sticking. Um, it allows you to do it very quickly and 
very reliably. In addition to that, two, I obviously look for full tang and kind of stouter or stronger knives. I also do tend to like CPM 3V because it is one of the more durable steels that can take an absolute beating. So do keep that in mind. Um, like I said, there's tons of survival knife options out there. And I think the most important thing is to have something. It doesn't necessarily have to be this big or made out of the most high quality materials, but I will say AK knives or architect knives is making very compelling offerings um, with things like the 6.5, the 4.5, even the eight inch, if you're really looking for a monster. Um, and the cool thing is when you go through their website, not to just only like a sales pitch, but it is cool that when you go through the website, you can set it up how you want to. So this one's set up to be ran as scout style. So that's why I have these two um, horizontal um, attachments here. So pretty cool. And also the Kydex sheaths that they make for these guys are, you know, very much, um, compatible with different types of setups. So you can put more things on this blade uh, or on the sheath to help you, um, be more prepared. Anyways, going into the next knife, because typically speaking, a proper survival knife is a little bit large. I like to balance it with something a little bit smaller. So something like this Mora Eldris is pretty cool because it is a smaller companion knife. So if you have to do things like dressing or skinning game animals, you'll be able to do those things very well. Also doing finer toothed carving things, it's pretty easy. And once again, a neck knife like this Mora Eldris is pretty darn cheap. So if you spend a lot of money on your main blade, you know, having something like this $20 Mora Eldris isn't too bad. You can throw it around your neck and just ultimately forget about it. So I think it's a pretty solid pick. There are, of course, once again, a bunch of other options out there that are solid, but I like to recommend the Mora Eldris because it's super cheap. So you can focus on getting a good quality survival knife and still have a decent backup. All right, other things that are very important for me are first off a hatchet. I think hatchets are probably the second most versatile um, tool that you can have when it comes to survival. They are very capable of doing a lot, a lot of things. And um, yeah, so this is my Grimfors Brooks Wildlife Hatchet. Once again, not a cheap um, tool. And I will say too, a lot of people look at my setups and look at my stuff and they're like, wow, you know, that is so expensive. All of this stuff together is you know, like a thousand dollars. And it's true, but none of this came together overnight. I didn't just go out and, you know, shell out a thousand dollars on survival tools. You can take your time and get more affordable options and then work your way up. You don't have to immediately go out and buy, you know, a $150 wildlife hatchet, right? Now, do I think the wildlife hatchet is probably one of the best options out there? I sure do and I do think it's very capable especially for its size but you don't have to go out and buy one of these immediately there are other options out there that are a little bit more affordable but something like a smaller hatchet something around you know 16 to around 12 inches in handle length with about a pound pound and a half head is going to work very well for expediently making field shelters and processing firewood for um, of course having fires for overnight staying warm now, last one up is the saw. Now, this can go either way. Baco Laplanders are very capable saws as well. This is a Silky Gomboy. This is a 210, and this one is, of course, curved, as you guys can see by the blade. But this is my personal choice. I would recommend the 210 because they do make smaller and larger Gomboys. But I think that the 210 is probably that sweet spot where this will still fit in most cargo pants pockets. And it still offers you a lot of very capable um, cutting edge here. There's a lot of really good use in this. And I like the curved blade because the curved blade just offers you a little bit more extra teeth because it's curved instead of just a flat straight arc. So it's a little bit more aggressive and it offers you a little bit more teeth. Once again, we're not talking about substantial here, but when you get something like this 210, it will rip through a lot of wood very fast. The Baco is a little bit smaller than the Silky 210, but it's also a very valiant option. And once again, the Baco is like 30 bucks, whereas this is unfortunately about 60 bucks. So you're looking about double the price, but it is very capable, I will say. Like I do not regret purchasing this guy. Um, it is an incredibly capable uh, saw. All right, so that covers most of our grounds for 
tools for crafting shelters, getting fire, um, doing the most important things. And once again, whenever we look at like survival, we want to focus on like the two most important things that are going to be most critical to your survival. And when we think about survival too, I have a little bit of a different mindset than most people on YouTube because I really hyper focus on actually surviving. A lot of people, you know, they, they go out and they show things or they, you know, put themselves in survival situations for the fun of it to see how long they can last. Even things like Alone, the TV show, are focused on how long can you last. For me, it's really how can we survive the first 72 hours? Because most survival efforts, once they realize you're lost, are going to be about you know, 72 hours of hard searching for you. So we want to essentially stay alive for the first 72 hours, stay as comfortable as we can. And this is another thing that a lot of people don't focus on, and that is that mental health is certainly a component to proper survival because if you aren't mentally healthy, then you're going to make poor decisions and poor decisions often lead to death. So when we think about it, like how can we keep ourselves, you know, the most mentally cognizant as we can so we can make good decisions that can affect our survival in the first 72 hours. So I really try to focus on that and that's the premise of this survival kit. And it's truly, like I said, how can we get rescued? It's not about, you know, how can we live out in the woods forever? If you wanna do that, there are other channels out there but I really focus on my survival equipment being totally oriented towards getting your butt out of a situation. That's why things like personal locator beacons, what I'm gonna talk about next, are the most important part of a survival kit because it's really, really cool to be able to make a shelter. It's really cool to be able to make a fire. And in some situations and circumstances, it may be critical that you do make a fire or that you do make a shelter. If it's pouring rain out or if it's you know blisteringly cold out, if it's negative 40, it's going to be very important for you to create a fire, have a shelter but at the core of it if you're out hiking in the rockies and you you know break your ankle or you sprain something and you cannot move off the mountain it's going to be very hard to use those tools that we just talked about to do anything constructive so having something like a personal locator beacon is very important because regardless to what personal locator beacon you have you can use these guys to signal for search and rescue and they know where you're at or a very precise location near where you are and they are alerted to say hey you need help this is my location and coordinates and so whether you choose this is my um, rescue link ACR so this is what I choose but um, there are a number of things such as spot there's the garment in reach system and there are a number of others out there that are coming out and there's even new systems that come out you know uh, on a yearly basis so i'm not going to say which one to choose this isn't a video about which one's best but carrying something like a personal locator beacon is insanely important and i really want to hammer this point because for the size of my palm you know this is literally a fail safe that will like i said alert the you know search and rescue or sar in your area that one you need help and two this is your exact coordinates and so this is something that's super super important it's such a small package for its capabilities and most once again garment in reaches spots most devices are like this you know they're about this size so really really compact now there are some costs to using these things it's important to know that um, you know if you use them they may or may not be free and there are once again other videos breaking down if you hit your you know sos button on your in reach what will the cost be and of course a lot of that determines or a lot of that's you know hinged off of like do you actually need medical attention if you need medical attention and you're taken to a hospital that's a hospital bill that doesn't have anything to do with your actual you know search and rescue cost and there are some times where search and rescue has their own cost and there's a lot of times where they don't if it's voluntary or a volunteer organization takes up your case and locates you then there's probably going to be no cost to you like, outside of once again any medical treatment so it just depends on a number of extenuating circumstances that like i said i can't necessarily advise because it's situationally dependent but regardless um, to what it's costing you it is very very what very much well worth it to have one of these because like I said if you like break your leg or you sprain an ankle or something and you physically cannot move off of the mountain it does not matter whether you have knives axes saws you could have a chainsaw you could have you know huge 
acts, right? If you can't physically move, if you're immobile or immobilized, you're dead in the water. So I want to stress it, and that's why I'm taking a you know individual chunk out of this video to talk about personal locator beacons because they're probably one of the best advent inventions for wilderness people. And once again, I've heard a startling amount of YouTube survivalists, people who are similar to me and their channels, apps are actually make fun of me for recommending personal locator beacons. And as I tell them, you know, if you're actually talking about survival, if you're actually talking about being rescued, like you want to get out of a situation, personal locator beacons make this most sense to me. Now, once again, we can get into, you know, they can fail, they are technology, they're not perfect, but for how much weight and how much size they take up, it makes absolutely no sense to me why you at least wouldn't have one. All right, that spiel aside, I know it's a bit of a bandwagon, but I really have to hammer it in because like I said, I am focused on trying to get people to actually take survival seriously and put rescue first. If you're rescue oriented, PLBs make a lot of sense. Now, going back to the survival aspects of this kit, we've talked about the tools, we've talked about you know the firearm, um, we've talked about you know how to best make use of the resources around you. Now, let's talk about the actual survival kit. Now, typically, now I do wanna note that Technically, this ACR is usually strapped to the bottom. That's why there's this really long paracord segment here. This is typically strapped to the bottom of my PSK. I pulled it off so I can individually talk about this without you know, moving my whole um, personal survival kit around. But let's actually talk about this PSK. So first off, let's, let's dig into some of the most important parts of it. You probably see this little guy right here. This is something that I like to do with this survival kit. And before we get into the survival kit, I should mention this is the Maxpedition Janus Pocket extension. I believe they still make these. This is a little bit of an older kit, but this is, as far as form factor goes, the largest slash smallest kit that I can fit everything that I would deem reasonably necessary for survival into. This is what I feel can comfortably carry everything that I would realistically need and want and have actually used in survival and near survival situations. So uh, once again, I don't purposely look to get into survival situations, but if you go outside and you spend any duration of time doing activities such as mountain biking, such as rock climbing, such as hiking, hunting, camping, anything like that, that's where my PSK in this whole kit comes with me. I take everything with me. Yes, I do mean I have cross country Country mountain biked and all of the things that you guys see here have been on my body like I'm not just like showing you guys a bunch of cool kit that would be cool to carry everything that you see here is actually carried once again um, you know I've used some of it I have used this kit not all of it at once but you know once again I have used different parts of this kit and uh, yeah so I can 100% say that this is stuff that I actually use and would use in a survival situation. Now, like I said, I like to leave this little orange tail sticking out. It is obviously closed by both of the zippers, so this cannot leave. But what this is, if you guys look in here, this is none other than a ferrocerium rod right there. Now, I have in this kit a few kind of like setups, and I like to have these kind of multiple kind of combination setups because it's a way to condense a lot of good stuff into a small little like bit of kit. This isn't necessarily the whole kit, but you know, it's kind of compacted. So right here, what you guys see is a Mylar blanket with two rubber bands. The rubber bands are useful for survival. Obviously the Mylar blanket is useful for survival. And then I have on this side, a peanut lighter kind of tucked away in here. It will obviously just slide out. And then of course, like I said, this guy slides out too. This is a ferrocerium rod. So I like to leave this guy exposed because fire is one of the most important things. And it is a very gross motor skill to be able to pop that zipper just a little bit, rip this guy out of the kit, but it lives right here. And so this is a very, like I said, easy and compact way to have rubber bands that are useful, mylar blanket that's useful, and two different fire starting methods there. Now, what I also snaked out and didn't properly show you guys too much were two cliff bars. Now, these cliff bars will get smashed and mashed, but I have eaten these cliff bars in the field. They they taste the same, whether they're crushed into you know a weird shape or not, they will taste the same. But the cliff bars are there primarily because once again, in a lot of survival situations, you find yourself in survival 
um, because a lack of preparation, right? So you might be hungry, you might be thirsty, you might honestly be needing something. I mean, there's been times where, like I said, I've been out um, cross-country mountain biking and I've burned thousands of calories, right? So a lot of times people may be like, you know, why do you carry extra food on you? It's because in certain survival situations, you're already working with a caloric deficit. Like I said, you aren't anticipating on a day where you go dirt biking or on a day where you go mountain biking or rock climbing or literally anything. You know, you're not necessarily anticipating burning through thousands of calories, but you might find yourself outdoors in the middle of nowhere already having burnt a thousand calories, 2000 calories. And granted a couple cliff bars isn't going to replace that. But what it does is it helps take pressure off of your brain because your brain's like, I am hungry. I need something. And so what it helps you do is eating a couple cliff bars or even a cliff bar helps take that edge off of it. So that once again, as we talked about with mental health, you can make a clear, concise choice of what you're going to do, what your next step is going to be instead of thinking, you know, we're making, um, poor decisions because of you know that influence on your brain you can take a step back take the edge off of your hunger take the edge off of your thirst by once again we'll get into this in a little bit um, of water or coffee and help make the right decision so that, that's why i carry these things these are more mental health items and once again as i've personally experienced in situations you might already be running a massive caloric deficit you know what i mean so that's important things to factor now in the middle of this survival kit we have about 10 feet of paracord i keep my paracord um, like this it's in a um, just simple kind of butterfly hitch here like butterfly thing I forget what it's technically called, but it's just a little cinched down situation of paracord. And once again, I leave guts in like this. And I do this for a couple of reasons. Some people ask, you know, why do you leave your paracord loose like this? I do this because this way I don't have to cut anything. I can pull these inner strands if I need. I have the inner strands if I need them. And then I also have paracord. Now there are different better paracords out there, but they can be thicker and more bulky and harder to pack. So I just prefer to carry normal paracord. All right, next one up is going to be the third fire method. Now, I think things like fire and shelter are the most important survival um, factors. They're gonna be the first two things to kill you. So that's why you see a lot of redundancy. This Mylar blanket is not the only Mylar blanket in here. So, and those fire methods are not the only fire methods, right? I also have matches in here. And then on top of the matches, um, to keep the matches suppressed, I have a little bit of steel wool in here. Now the steel wool is useful because you can hook batteries to it. If you have batteries, you might, you know, be running a GPS and that GPS just so happens to have AA batteries. You can take a AA battery, hook that steel wool to the positive negative terminals and it will cook off. So you can use the steel wool to start fire. You can use the matches, you can use the ferro rod, you can use the lighter. I'm trying to create hyper redundancy in an easy package. So that's my fire methods. That's um, just a very simple way of doing it. All right, next one up, and we're gonna get into kind of a two-parter of it, is water. So water is also very important. Let's get a little bit more of a mental health. It is important too for survival, but a little bit more mental health important. And this is one that, thanks to the comments, this, this is one that I updated. Now, previously in my survival kit, I had um, condoms, just unlubed normal condoms, and you can still use those for water catchment and holding. They are a bit fragile, so you do have to be careful, and they're not particularly reusable, but these guys are pretty cool. What these are is just plastic bags. They're pretty much touted as like single use, but um, they're a liter bag and I have mine currently rolled up right now. These are called Whirl Packs if you guys want to get them. Um, these guys are on Amazon. You can get like, I think it's like three for five dollars is what I paid. And so these guys are like little Whirl Packs. Um, like I said, the cool thing about them, unlike the condoms, is that they are a much thicker plastic and they are already the size of a liter. So once you unroll this, you have about a liter size. And the other cool thing is they are sealed. So they have a little like tear top to them. So you tear the top off of it, you know, grab your water and you can go from there. So I have these guys, I have three of them in here. I had to downsize. I previously had four condoms, which can hold up to a liter of water. I have three of these in here because like I said, the pro to them is they're much more durable than a condom, but they are also um, a lot 
like they're thicker plastic, they're a larger form factor. So um, yeah, so I only was able to put three of them in here as opposed to, like I said, previously having four condoms. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate, but they are, I think, better and more reusable. So I think they are, the World Packs are the way to go. Now, of course, you need some way to, to purify that water. Now, of course, as people would hopefully know, in a pinch, most waterborne illnesses are things like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. So I'm not encouraging people to go out and um, drink just straight up water, um, just pond water. But um, if you have to, you can drink straight up pond water. And most of the time, things like Cryptosporidium, Giardia will not instantly kill you. So if it comes down to dying of dehydration or drinking pond water, do drink pond water because we can, in a medical setting, very easily treat Giardia and Cryptosporidium, and we can't easily treat death from dehydration. So drink the pond water if you absolutely have to. But once again, I have iodine tablets. These guys are pretty easy to carry in a form factor like this. Once again, this is more than enough tablets to purify three liters of water. And so this is a pretty good system. It works pretty well. And it's not gonna be the most tasty way to do things, but it will be safe drinking water. So iodine tablets and whirl packs are my kind of water solution. <clears throat> now, if you have the ability to heat up water, um, which I do also have in this pack, um, I'm carrying a few instant coffee little bits here. Now, once again, the instant coffees, some people, you know, will say like, you know, caffeine and coffee dehydrates you. This is true. But once again, this is more of a mental health thing where, you know, having something like this can make you feel a little bit more at home and can ease your situation a little bit better. So I think for the form factor, for what it's worth, I do still think things like instant coffee, like these little Starbucks Vias are worth it in my opinion, because they do help give you a little bit of a caffeine boost, but they also, um, you know, get you a little bit more of that kind of at home. Now, of course, you can also take these. These are just straight up, you know, like uh, dehydrated coffee. So just like mashed up. So you can just put this in your mouth. It will dissolve. You don't necessarily need to, you know, roast it as they tell you to do. You can just make the, or you can just literally put these in your mouth. Um, they will work just fine. Once again, it is a dehydration risk, but I feel like the risk, the cost versus the benefit, um, or the benefit outweighs the cost, I should say. Fucking English. Also have a little bit of tin foil in here. This is actually quite a bit of tin foil. It's just very well compacted. It gives you something that's once again, pretty waterproof and something that you can put on a fire if you need to, this will heat up. So you can make different cups, different things out of this. Obviously you're not gonna be able to make huge, you know, water tight things out of these, but you know, something's better than nothing. So yeah, um, anyways, so that is tin foil. All right, looking into the other side of this pack, um, once again, this is kind of how it looks. You can see the whirl packs are right over here on this far side, so it's very hard to show. And then we're looking at this side of the pack. So we have a whistle. Whistles are great, very rudimentary, very gross motor skill for signaling attention. The other thing I have in here is some more heavy duty matches. These are um, the Titan matches from I'm trying to remember who it is, like I think it's UCO or something like that, but these are the heavy duty matches. Of course, I have the strike face in there with them. Um, some of them, as you can see, have unfortunately broken due to the tight nature of this. Most of them are still intact, but some have broken. And in my opinion, even if these guys do break, this actual orange bit here lasts so long that it really doesn't matter. You will still probably be able to start a fire with these guys. So these UCO Titan matches, I think are worth it. Um, they definitely are a very heavy duty, very robust match. Now, the other thing is, once again, we've talked about a lot of redundancy here. These are, there's a rubber band on here and they are in a plastic bag. Now I don't necessarily have these in a plastic bag for any particular, like they don't need to be in a plastic bag, but I like the plastic bag because it does keep them organized. And most of all, it's another plastic bag, right? So hard to go wrong with extra redundancies for things like water catchment or other things like that. Now, other things that are in here, we have some of these little guys right here. These are 
UST wet fires. And uh, these guys right here, um, even when they're powdered like this, you can see that this is very compressed, very flat. Some of them are not as flat. They still absolutely work. You can literally powder these things. They will still catch on fire. It does not matter their state of condition. So long as the bag is intact and it's not exposed to oxygen, these things will still work. So some of them are more crushed than others. Some of them are still pretty, pretty good. So once again, due to the unfortunate nature of how compacted this kit is, it does get compressed. All right, part two. So the next part up is live fire. So live fire is pretty cool because these guys are these little tins of cotton saturated, or sorry, wax saturated cotton. And so you can rough up the ends of it like I have previously and start fires with it. And the cool thing is you can control how long you get with your burn. So once again, all of these are different tinders. I also have some tinder quick in here that is going to work pretty well. And my kind of basis for whether I use tinder quick or whether I use wet fire, if I'm trying to start a fire in a water saturated environment, I will typically use the wet fire, but there's a lot of times when you just need fire and so the tinder quicks are just once again cotton um, impregnate impregnated with different um, like waxes and stuff to help them last a little bit longer so these tinder quicks are super easy to use however it is worth noting like if you just so happen to accidentally take a swim or this unit becomes wet that's why i have so many things like even the titan matches are in a plastic bag i have these things that technically the titan matches should work even when wet but things like the wet fire and stuff i try to have them sealed so that in case you do take a plunge accidentally or unintentionally you do have your butt covered pretty well that is essentially the setup there. So yeah, that's basically it for my fire specific setup. Now, rounding out this kit as a whole, once again, I told you this would be a long video, we have my last kind of setup here, my last kind of conglomerated setup. Now, this is a bandana. Once again, we got more rubber bands. You know I love my rubber bands. Um, so we have more rubber bands, we have a bandana, and then we have a actual Mylar blanket in here. Now, this Mylar blanket, um, I'm trying to remember, I, this is an SOL Mylar blanket, and long ago, far away, I did a YouTube video comparing different Mylar blankets. It was never a super popular video, but I did break down like 10 different brands, and I found that the SOL, or Survive Outdoors Longer, um, brand of Mylar blankets was not only the largest, but also the thickest. And this is something that I think a lot of people overlook because, you know, they just think, oh, Mylar blanket, right? Just, just buy one of them. But these guys really do get damaged very easily and that's kind of a problem because mylar blankets obviously being very thin their insulation doesn't come from their thickness or how well the material holds heat like a traditional um you, a traditional type of insulation would like a wool blanket keeps you warm because the actual fiber retains heat very well and reflects it right mylar only reflects um, heat. So if you get a little hole in it, it will, even a pinprick will let a lot of heat out. So Mylar blankets are very temperamental. So that's why um, I have backups to them and also why I prefer thick, heavier duty Mylar blankets. So the SOL Mylar blanket is the one that I recommend the most. And to prevent any of those pinpricks or damage, because this is my main blanket this one is wrapped in a bandana to prevent anything from cutting into it because obviously as we've discussed there are things in here and nothing in this kit is particularly sharp but once again even something like this glass could get up against it scratch it scrape it and put a small hole in it so i keep this guy at the bottom and it is covered in a bandana last but not least i should almost forgot mentioning i do have a little bit of snare wire in here snare wires um, useful for as the name implies snaring creating snares it can be done very easily with this stuff but also too it's pretty high tensile strength for how thin the wire is that is actually what lives at the very bottom of this kit but it definitely um lives at the bottom once again underneath everything and um, i keep this guy wrapped so that it doesn't the snare wire doesn't poke a hole in it so yeah, that is the kit as a whole. Um, the only thing I didn't mention was the final thing, and that is up front, I keep a little basic medical tin in here. This has some you know, different little medications in it, some bandages, some um, triple antibiotic ointment, just basic stuff like that, so that if you get any you know, little 
cuts or any little lacerations or anything, you have that there. Obviously, it doesn't have a tourniquet in it. You know, if anything serious happens, you really should have a dedicated medical kit. And that's where, you know, similar to having external things like hatchets, axes, saws. Like I get so many people that are like, oh, you know, just add this knife or just add this to your kit and, you know, it'll be better. And for me, I don't really like to compromise on, you know, having like a tiny little saw, like any, you know, tool that would fit in my survival kit, this, this PSK we just talked about, probably wouldn't be large enough to really be very useful. So that's why I don't really keep, you know, any like, um, tools in this actual kit. I have previously carried like knives in here and stuff. And that's like I said, how I got to the conclusion that anything that would be the size or be able to fit in this kit would not be a particularly useful tool. Like a an ax or hatchet that can fit in here will not be particularly useful. Um, so anyways, that has been an overview of my entire survival setup and kit. It is very comprehensive. It does take a long time to break down. That's why I usually only do this about once a year. Hopefully you enjoyed the video, guys. As always, God bless, and I'm out.